Earlier this month, President Donald Trump, he announced a, quote, very substantial phase one deal with China on trade that followed months of back and forth between the two countries. But there are several lawmakers who are skeptical about China's willingness to play fair. In his new book, Trump versus China, Facing America's Greatest Threat, former House Speaker Newt Gingrich argues that in order to respond to China's efforts, doing so will require new thinking, big changes, and hard choices. He joins us now to expand on this. Mr. Speaker, it's great to see you. Good to be with you. Absolutely. Mr. Speaker, why, tell us a little bit about why you decided to write this book at this particular time while all the trade negotiations are happening? Well, no, I actually started writing the book several years ago. Mm -hmm. And I did so because I realized that China was dramatically different than most of us thought it was and that I was one of the people who was wrong and that as I learned more about it, I thought it would be useful to have a book that sort of laid out conceptually the basic facts about China mm -hmm. and allowed people to see how fundamentally different it is from what people have said in the past. So tell us, you, the most fascinating part of your own book is actually admitting your own role within this, about talking about the WTO, about per, the P, PNTR, Permanent Normal Trade Relations sure. with China. Tell us what it was like to no. be in that Congress in the 90s and, well, to, and to think of China as this place that would democratize with trade. Well, remember, the, 90, yeah. the, the 90s actually are preceded in 89 by mm -hmm. Tiananmen Square. Right. So there's a brief period when we're talking about sanctions, when we're really mad at the Chinese, mm -hmm. et cetera. And then in 1992, Deng Xiaoping, who was the real leader of China at the time, goes on what's called the Southern Tour and argues that they have to go to a market-oriented open system right. if they're going to survive and makes the famous case that he didn't care whether it's a black cat or a white cat. He cared if it caught mice. And his mm -hmm. argument was, don't tell me ideology. We've got to find a way to create wealth. And at the time, many of us, and I include me, thought this was a first step towards opening up China, which in retrospect was a huge mistake. It was a first step towards creating enough wealth to sustain the dictatorship, mm -hmm. not creating enough wealth right. to change from the dictatorship. And it was only, so I, so I was in favor of China joining the World Trade Organization, as was Ed mm -hmm. Fulner at Heritage, and he and I have compared notes on occasion, because <laughs> we thought Getting them into a rules-based system yes. would gradually permeate their culture and that that would be a big step in the right direction. Um, that was all wrong. Uh, the Chinese, in fact, decided to corrupt the WTO rather than be changed by it. And uh, I think we began to realize uh, sometime, probably under Bush and then even more under Obama, that the Chinese were playing by different rules and that they were driven by fundamentally different beliefs than we thought they were. Mm -hmm. And so I decided that I really wanted to put together a book, partly for myself, but also because I thought it was useful to have somebody who had been part of the Chinese consensus, or the consensus on China, to say, wait a second, here's where it went wrong, here's why people like me need to change their opinions, and this is how big the challenge is going to be. Well, I th I, I, it's very rare to actually see somebody who was involved in this to come out and say, no, we were wrong about this. I think perhaps most emblematic in this recent incident with the NBA, right? You know, we see this total capitulation to China by LeBron James and by so many of the athletes, the league, and so many others. And it just shows how tied our economies are now, that corporations, even Disney CEO Bob Iger came out yesterday, said the lesson he learned from the NBA kerfuffle is not to speak out against the Chinese. And so how is it that we've come to this place and what do we do about it when our biggest corporations and most famous are bought off by Chinese cash? Well, I think, first yeah. of all, the notion that uh uh, profits defeat patriotism is not exactly new. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't think you can ask an individual company to stand up against an entire sovereign state. Uh, I think part of what we're probably going to have to invent is a model where a com company which is being pressured by the Chinese can turn to the American government to defend it. Yes. And if, you know, if we had stepped in and said, look, you can go ahead and hurt the NBA, here are the six Chinese companies that we're going to wipe out. Mm -hmm. So just understand, you want to play this game, we'll play the game too. What you can't do is have a totally one-sided deal. And it is a little pathetic to see, I mean, Disney's the biggest film company in the world. The, the idea that they are intimidated by the Chinese dictatorship should tell you how really serious a problem this right. is. And I, I absolutely think it does. I mean, Bob Iger has no problem being in an open feud with the president of the United States. Yeah. But with Chi Chinese President Xi Jinping, 
There's no that's right. And, old and, bar. and you have the same you have yeah. the same challenge that you know billionaire owners of clubs who would defend the right of their athletes to take a knee or to right. to be disrespectful of the American flag, disrespectful of the national anthem, will turn right around and kowtow to a Chinese dictatorship. Mm -hmm. And that should trouble Americans and tell them a little bit about how far out of whack our current uh, strategies are. Well, I think this one in particular has struck a nerve. And I, I guess the question here is with the president. There's no question President Trump has moved the Overton window on China more than any other person. I doubt we're ever going back. Do you do worry, though, that he might, that he has, the, he has all the financial incentives in the world to take, you know, an insubstantial deal in order to ensure his reelection going into 2020? Do you have confidence that he will ensure that there will be the strongest possible terms in his, any sort of negotiated deal? Well, no, I have confidence yeah. that he will push the system pretty hard mm -hmm. and then get a deal for exactly the reason you said. And that's right. not irrational. Mm. And I have every confidence that oh, about the year two or three of his next term, he'll be right back at the Chinese <laughs> again. Okay. Uh, and, and the Chinese have a problem because they have a very deep tradition of saying yes and lying. And this is a president who I think initially won't want to believe it, but will believe it, and he will then take appropriate steps to respond. So uh, there's a story just today, as you and I are talking, yeah. that the Chinese have now agreed to very substantial changes about intellectual property rights. Well, you know, the president knows yeah. that the enforcement mechanism is the key. I mean, the Chinese are people who they cut a deal and start cheating immediately. And their view is that it's your job to enforce the deal. And if you're dumb enough that they can cheat on it, shame on you. Right. So, Mr. Speaker, obviously, we ha while we have you here, there's this impeachment inquiry that's going on in the House. You, you know, were involved in the last impeachment inquiry against Bill Clinton. What is it about this one in particular? You said that they don't, there's no chance that the Senate will move forward with it, and you've decried this present inquiry. What's different now than it was under your time? Almost everything. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a despicable violation of the American Constitution. Um, the British outlawed star chamber proceedings where you don't know who your accuser right. is in 1641. We wrote into the Bill of Rights that you're guaranteed due process as part of that same experience. Um, the idea that they are holding secret hearings with the president's counsel excluded, with the Republicans having no ability to subpoena everyone, anyone, with all the records being kept by the Democrats, so the Republicans can't take anything out of the room. Uh, I mean, this is such a one-sided, dishonest, and corrupt process that it's astonishing. Now, let me draw the contrast. Uh, the best single book on this is by Jim Rogan, who was a member of the Judiciary Committee uh, in 1998. He wrote a book called Catching the Flag. Uh, when we started differently. Remember, we had an independent counsel, and Trump had an independent counsel. The independent counsel for Clinton came back and said, on, on 11 counts, he's guilty. Use the word guilty, mm -hmm. including felonies. Miller came back and never used the word guilty once. So frankly, I thought it was over. But Pelosi and the Democrats can't stand it. So they start making things up. When we accepted the report, we did so on a bipartisan basis. Uh, Democratic leader Gephardt and I held a press conference together and announced that we had both agreed that the entire report would be published so the whole country could read it. Uh, we then sent Rogan, uh, Congressman Rogan, up to New Jersey to meet with uh, Peter Rodino, who had been the Democratic chairman of the Judiciary Committee during Watergate. Mm -hmm. And Rodino was very widely regarded as being really fair. Rodino gave Rogan all of the rules that Rodino had used. Rogan brings them back to us, and we implement every single rule. Now, And none of those rules are currently in place? None. Zero. I mean, I think Rodino would be sick at mm. the degree to which this is now a kangaroo yeah. court and totally phony. So the final question I have for you, sir, this is a question I've been asking many of the Republicans like yourself, which is, what does the GOP look like after President Trump? So let's say, you know, he, he makes it all the way to 2024. Is, is our skeptical position to free trade, to China, and to the entire idea about, of, of family policy, is that here to stay? 
or, totally. or sure. are we back to you know well, I mean, first the contract all, I mean, of America? I mean, by family yeah. policy, I mean abortion. That was true for Reagan. Uh -huh. I mean, that's not a. Well, I mean more about you know, child tax credits. The not, just the the obsession with eliminating the federal debt, more towards using government policy in order to but bolster. I don't know of any effort yeah. to eliminate the child tax credit. Uh, oh no, 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 I'm saying that we that the president has input the child tax credit. I'm right. saying that's been quite skeptical by you know Grover Norquist and by yeah. other these types of groups. That those were groups you were much in line with and and really brought to the fore with your politics. Um, I would say that. There will be a more blue-collar, mm -hmm. um, more aggressive party than it was before Trump. I would say that it will be much stronger about national sovereignty than it was before Trump. Um, it will be much tougher on deregulation than it was before Trump. Um, and, I, and if he lasts till 2024, They'll be presiding within a world that's overwhelmingly conservative judges. I mean, it'll be a, it'll be such a profound revolution in the judiciary that it'll be nobody's fully come to grips yet. I think I think they have eight more judges coming up right. this week. I mean, Mitch yeah. McConnell's it's a quiet doing revolution. It. Yeah. Mitch McConnell's doing his job. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for joining me, Mr. Good Speaker. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. We'll have more rising for you right after this.